one. This is the fifth and final part of my calculator section walkthrough of College Board's first SAT. If you haven't seen the previous parts, those might be good to check out first before watching this one. As always, this video is sponsored by Prep Scholar. Prep Scholar offers online SAT and ACT courses, and with thousands of practice questions written by SAT experts, they are the paid tutoring service that I most highly recommend. They have in-depth concept videos for the math and the reading sections, which is super helpful, and they guarantee a 160 point increase in your score. So if you're interested, check out the links in the description below to get $50 off their SAT or ACT prep, or you can check out their tutoring services, which they recently launched. Anyway, let's get into those final questions. All right, finally, we're at the free response section. Thankfully, these start out a little easier again. So we have Wyatt can husk at least two dozen ears of corn per hour, and at most eight dozen ears of corn per hour. Based on this information, what is a possible amount of time and hours that it could take Wyatt to husk 72 dozen ears of corn. So we're all in the units of dozen here, so that should be fine to ignore. His minimum rate is like 12 times the hours is the number of ears of corn, and his max rate is 18h. We want to get to the value 72. In the minimum case, we would do 72 divided by 12, and the max we'd do 72 divided by 18. So we get that best case scenario he's done in four hours, worst case scenario he's done in six hours. We can pick any time in between here, including those two values. Erring on the side of caution, I'm just gonna say five for this one, but it's really anywhere between four and six, since it's a possible amount of time that it would take him. The posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying exit identical boxes each weighing 14 pounds will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum value for X that will keep combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes below the bridge's posted weight limit? So that weight limit is 6,000. We want to be below that. And this is kind of just a y equals mx plus b, except it's an inequality instead of an equation. So we have all these boxes, they weigh 14 pounds each, and then we have the starting mass of like the empty truck with just the driver in it. We want to find the value where it's just a little bit under 6,000 pounds. So for all intents and purposes, we can set these equal to each other and solve for x. And divide by 14. All right, so we have x equals 107.1. Remember, x is equal to the number of boxes. We can't have a part of a box, so we're going to have to round this. And we definitely want to round this down, because if we went to 108, then that would be slightly over the limit, and that would collapse the bridge or whatever. So we want to go down to 107 boxes, just to be safe, so that we know that this whole expression is below 6,000. It's very important to make sure you're reading what the x actually represents, because otherwise you might bubble in 107.1 as your answer. And that's not right, because you can't have a tenth of a box in practical terms. According to the line above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? So these are the two values we're looking for, and these are the numbers sold in millions. In 2008, there were 100 million sold, and in 2011, there were 160 million sold. So we can just divide these by each other since we're looking for the fraction. We don't even need our calculator for this. We can just simplify that to 5 eighths, or if you want, yeah, we get the same answer. So we can either bubble in 5 eighths or 0.625, I believe. All right, so a local television station sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. If the station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week, what is the total number of 30 minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? So let's treat these little intervals as chunks. So we have like our whole week and we have these chunks that they can sell for time slots. There's 24 hours per day. There's gonna be two 30 minute intervals per hour. So that means there's gonna be 48 of these little 30 minute intervals per day. So we know that the station operates every single day, so we don't have to worry about that. But we're looking for specifically Tuesday and Wednesday together. We have two days worth of time slots. So we can just multiply this by two to get 96. And that's how many time slots are available. If you don't like doing it all willy-nilly like this, you can set up dimensional analysis to help check yourself. Or we'll say two time slots per hour times 24 hours per day. Then we have two days because we're looking at Tuesday and Wednesday. And we see the hours are going to cancel out, the days are going to cancel out, and we're left with this many time slots. So that would be two times 24 times two which is the same thing that we did, and we get 96. Um, okay, last page. A dairy farmer uses a storage silo that is in the shape of the right circular cylinder above. If the volume of the silo is 72 pi cubic yards, what is the diameter of the base of the cylinder in yards? So we're gonna use the volume of a cylinder equation for this. Um, if you don't remember, it is actually on the front of the test, which is pretty handy. V equals pi r squared times the height of our cylinder. We know the volume is 72 pi, 
And then we know that our height is eight yards. We can plug that in for h. Now, look what happens. Our pi's cancel out, and 72 divided by eight is nine. That's equal to the radius squared then. So we know our radius is plus or minus three, or in this case, we can't have a negative radius, so just three. But be warned, they're looking for the diameter of the base of the circle. They even underlined it for us so we don't screw that up. Um, so the diameter is just twice the radius. So if our radius is three, the diameter will be six. And to check yourself, maybe just plug in this radius to the volume equation and verify that you get 72 pi cubic yards as your volume. Now, for what value of x is the function h above undefined? So when you see something like this, the first main way I think of, of making this undefined is making this bottom zero. So if we had a one over zero, that would be undefined. So what happens if we just set this denominator equal to zero, like that. Now we can solve for x here. So if we expand this out, x squared minus 5x minus 5x plus 25, then we have plus 4x minus 20 plus 4 equals zero. And then we combine everything that we can. So we have x squared minus 6x plus 9. And it's pretty easy to factor this one quickly using the x method. But now's a good time to also tell you guys about my little calculator trick that I like. So if you go to apps in your calculator and go to number eight on the applications, um, go to polynomial root finder, you'll be able to type in this equation with your coefficients like this, hit solve, and it'll give you your values of x. And in this case, we see that it's three and three, which is good because it says value, not values of x. So three is our answer here using our handy dandy little calculator. We could also just solve this using the x method or a similar method of factoring. So if you have what multiplies to nine and adds up to negative six, we get negative three and negative three. So then if we have x minus three, x minus three equals zero. Solving for x would give us x equals three in both cases. So we did it two ways, got the same answer. Third way to check this would be just to plug in the three to this denominator and see if you get zero, but I'm pretty confident in that. So for our last problem, Jessica opened a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100 and she uses the expression 100 times x to the t to find the value of the account after t years. Now what is the value of x in the expression? So now is probably a good reminder of the compound interest equation. You have your final value equals your initial value times, this is basically your rate, but written a little more complicated of a way, to the power of t. This n here is good if you're not compounding the same amount of time as your value of time. So in this case, we are. We're compounding annually, and we're looking at years, which is annual. So we don't really need the n here to overcomplicate things. So we can just write it as this. So we have our initial value of 100. It earns 2% interest, which would be that written as a decimal. So 1 plus that is 1.02 to the power of t equals like our final thing after t years. So we see that our value of x is going to be 1.02. To check this, you could even plug in a value for t if you wanted to. So like after 10 years, how much money will she have? She'll have $121. And that's a reasonable amount for interest. It's definitely going to be greater than 100. We know that. And it's not going to be anything like crazy with a 2% interest rate. That's a good check for that one. Now we have that Jessica's friend Tashawn found an account that earns 2.5% interest compounded annually. He made an initial deposit of $100 into this account at the same time that Jessica made her deposit of $100 into her account. After 10 years, how much more money will Tashawn's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? And this is just directions on rounding and writing in your answer. Okay, so kind of glad we did this because we kind of saved ourselves a step here. 10 years is our value of t for both accounts. And Jessica's equation looks like this. Tashawn's equation, we'll call that a2, looks like this, since he has a slightly higher interest rate of 2.5 instead of 2. So we can just plug in the t equals 10 to both equations, subtract them, and that gets us how much more money he's earned than Jessica. So we already plugged in the 10 to Jessica's. Let's plug in the 10 to this one as well. So we get 128. If we subtract the 2, we get about 6.1. And remember, these are in dollars, and we're rounding to the nearest cent. So we want to go 6.11 dollars. And we ignore the dollar sign when gridding in, so our answer is 6.11. And to check this, just make sure that you're comparing the right things, that you wrote this equation right, and that you don't make any careless mistakes with your calculator. All right, so that is going to be it for the math section. Thanks for sticking with me through this whole walkthrough. I know the calculator section is really long, but you made it through. I hope these videos have been helpful for you to see a little bit more how I work through the questions and help you develop your own strategy. For the future, I'm going to focus mainly on the digital SAT, since after spring 2024 hits, the paper SAT will be a thing of the past. But keep an eye out for my digital SAT mini walkthroughs, and I'll still make some more general videos on tips and strategies for that as well. That probably still applied to the old SAT. 
Anyway, thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.